Okay. So this was chapter number one. And again, uh, I would also uh, want you to pay attention to uh, the objectives. I do want you to know what are the difference between innate and acquired immunity. I want you to know what is the clonal selection theory. You should know what clonal selection theory is. What are the differences between humoral and cellular immunity? And then finally, uh, this theme for diversity in terms of immune response and its benefits. So pretty much if I have to pick up for five questions per chapter, so five questions are already there. But now, remember when I say five questions, each one of them has a distractor. So in multiple choice question, what happened is that within one question, you have five different choices. So five times five is 25. So this means 25 different concepts can be tested in five questions. That's what the multiple question, choice question is all about. So uh, for example, these are the basic things. So I want, want you to pay attention to what is the definition of innate immunity. And also to remind you that when I write question, I write question from my slides. I don't write, open up the book and write question. So pretty much I'm looking at these slides. I'm gonna open up this page and look at it, I want to test you if you know in the community. So my question is, like for example, which of the following would confer, confer in the community? So I'm gonna say, number one, people are born with it. They're always present. It's available at short time. It is a challenge by, by foreign invaders, right? And then say, all of the following will confer in the community except so I'm going to take one from adapter and put it over there. So this will test whether you understand the differences between innate immunity or adaptive immunity. If I was to look at that, because the whole idea, remember for uh, most of the slides in microbiology and immunology, uh, since they are content intense, and each one of the slides has been put over there for a purpose. I want you to know that there are two components of immune response, cellular and acellular. And you should be clear with that. When I say acellular, so again the question, simple natural question will be which of the following are the acellular components? And I'll write four choices and put a cell there as well. So you can kind of go and find out what is going on. Right? Or sometime in order to uh, change the type of question, I would say which of the fall, all of the following are acellular components of the immune response except. So it's the same question twisted in different way. So you should be very, very clear. You should, be, you sh you should have no doubt that interferons are cytokines, interferons basically are acellular. So think, when you think of cells, it should be very clear in your mind. You gotta say acellular. So you have to also pay attention. I can also say which of the following are cellular components and then put acellular versus cellular as well. So some of them are a tricky question. For example, these are the cellular components. So I'll just chip in an acellular over there and test you whether you know what is acellular versus cellular. Right, because you have to, I wish I had a ch lecture with you how to do multiple choice questions because itself is a, it's more of a technique than the knowledge. And you will gather from your friends, some of people may not study hard and may not spend hours and hours and wake up whole night, but we call it smart studying. They, they pretty much would know. If the professor is talking about that in the class, he's gonna ask that, simple. No need for you to go here and there, right? So you should be really well skilled. It's a skill, 
So when it comes to exam, it's more of a skill based. You will see that that quality. I mean, if you happen to see your friend, ask them. The people have that knack of it. They they have that feeling. So even if they don't know that the answer, they can pick up the way the question is designed. Okay, simple. There's there's no uh, you know problem with that. Again, uh, differences between innate and adaptive. These are the questions. I'm going to test you for this. For innate adaptive, you better know what is innate and what adaptive. So the question can be switched around as you saw, as you saw in the sample question as well that uh, for example the characteristics of innate and immune adaptive and the immune components and also remember uh, the chances are that I will not test you for the thing which are similarities because I'm looking for differences I want to check because what happens is uh, for multiple choice questions basically they not only check your recall memory uh, just, uh, I mean, remind me or tell me, especially before microbiology, I'll take you through uh, how the multiple choice questions are written and how uh, they are answered. And even uh, the best of all the medical schools, when they prepare their residents for taking board exam, they train them. They train. It's a training. This is a way to do. So some people will come to me and say, I read the book A to Z, I spent this and that, I failed. Of course, because you don't know how to take an exam. Right? So it's more of a technique, a skill, more of a training of understanding the question. So that's why if you're sitting for all two hours, nothing is going to fall on, from the sky to help you. You are struggling. Right? Right? So keep in mind, again, acquired immunity, differences between acquired and and then, of course, uh, I'm going to ask you the difference between what is an antigen and what is the difference between an antigen and immunogen. Because we did spend time on that. Right? And then, again, you will see that I've been repeating over and over again that all immunogens are antigens and all antigens are not immune. So basic conceptual knowledge. Okay? Uh, question, simple question over there. Uh, active immunization, passive immunization, adaptive immunization. So this question usually may come in the form of combination. So some of the questions are combination. I'm going to put active immunization slash or colon your admission antigen. Passive immunization slash or colon admission specific antibody. And one of them is going to be wrong. So you have to have that association between what has been asked and what is it being tied to. Acquired immune response, we talk about that. And then uh, cells involved in acquired immune response. Remember the previous one was talking about cells uh, in immune response per se together. But now we are more specific. We are talking about acquired immune response. So I may say, uh, which, of the which of the following cell is not a part of acquired immune response? And guess what? Neutrophil is not there. Okay? And if you go to the next slide, you will see these are the cells. They become part of both innate and acquired. They are not directly a part of acquired, but they can be called in. Yes, they are like a little bit non-specific. Right? So these are like tricky questions. Because remember that when you ask a question of multiple choice questions, those choices that you think are A, B, C, D, E, we call them distractors. This means the moment you ask a question, immediate answer comes to your mind, then you want to distract you, distract you to test the depth of knowledge. It's not like straight yes and no. That's why true and false, you can just spin the you know, coin, toss the coin, heads up, head or tail. That doesn't happen here. So five questions will at least give you a 20% probability of getting it right or wrong. So that's what it is. Okay? I want you to know clone selection theory. You have to read it. Simple. It's not uh, difficult. Humoral and cellular immunity. It's all there. And then uh, pretty much this uh, will concentrate on the first five objectives. Antibodies are coming later on. Uh, Cell-mediated immunity versus humoral immunity. I think 
the other thing you also keep in mind is that when you study and when I teach, I teach like lecture to lecture. So it makes you feel that you're not being tested for chapter one alone. So you're going to be tested for 10 chapters. There's going to be overlap and inter inter integration and mix and match. Do you understand the point? Because you're tested for the basic immune system. Right? So what I would, because it maybe it's not in your mind. Some of you may have studied four chapter, five chapters, left, left one or other. But in my mind, it's a complete 10 chapters. I would not ask you a clinical one, but I'm going to bring in distractors from everywhere. Okay, that's a little bit hard, but if you have a good concept, what is cell mediated immunity, what does it take, and then again, uh, what is the difference between B cell and T cell, and then function of T cells, it will also come in other uh, chapters as well. One important thing that you saw was and it's a theme of immune system that it generates diversity. It di generates diversity in terms of uh, antigen production or antigen, uh, I would say, dealing or antibody production or generating in each one of us is different. Now, I'm, my question is, where is it coming from? Why are we diverse? Because simple thing is, it's coming from your genes. So that diversity is coming from the genes, okay? Right, so let's move on to the next one. There's nothing special about that. So again, you saw pretty much repeat. Again, it comes in it and acquired. We already talked about that. But this time is more of, in this lecture, fate of antigen after penetration. So let's see what happens to an antigen when it penetrates, right? So each and every immunology book is different, but if you saw this chapter one and chapter two, I wouldn't say redundancy, but I would say repeat. And you'll see me repeating it over and over and over and over again, because it kind of helps. So you kind of put things in perspective. Again, you have innate immunity. There's a good chart for you to find out that they are all coming from pluripotent stem cell, right? But you have to understand uh, the way that things are coming from here. You can see, for example, most of the lymphoid cells are coming from common lymphoid progenitor, which is totally different than the other myeloid progenitors. So they are coming from different cells. And then again, you will see B and T cell. So all cellular components of blood are there. Okay. Uh, simple process of uh, endocytosis, phagocytosis, and plasma membrane. So the whole idea is in this one, uh, I think the upshot for this picture other than your basic biology is that uh, this is a receptor mediated endos endocytosis. When it comes to macromolecules, cells would take via receptors, right? And then they come in a very precise vesicles. And you see all these vesicles, once they are in, they are fused with something. The most important thing is that there is a, if a bacteria is taken in, it is fused with lysosome. Because lysosome has those lytic enzymes that will kill it. Repeat slide. These are self-involved immune system. A little bit detailed. Okay. Now, this one. You can see from here, uh, we've been talking about killer cell. Remember, uh, I told you that make your own slide or a, you know, graph or a table where you put each and every player and ask this question to yourself or when you appear in learning, uh, what is the difference between a killer inhibitory cell dealing with a normal cell as a where, because remember these killer cell ideally should not kill your normal cell, you agree? Right? And they should kill the cells which are needed to be killed, like for example, a virus infected or a tumor cell, right? 
So what you would see over here is, my question will be, what makes that choice? How, how the killer cell sees this is a foe or friend? And this, let me do the talking. I know you've got so much immunology in you, it's going to burst out. Uh, give, give yourself a week next Friday. So you see over here, the killer cell has machinery, but it would go and identify. So it identifies normal cell because normal cell basically presents an MSC. So this sees over here and say, hey, this is the same gene as mine. So this is me. I'm not going to kill it. But then over here it sees there is no gene expression. So it's going to go after that and kill it. Uh, inflammation, again, we've been talking about inflammation. We'll keep on talking about inflammation. Inflammation is the hallmark. With every disease, is going to start with inflammation. And uh, we need to know uh, now, a little bit different for immunology, I would say, what is the role of immune system in inflammation? So there is a role for the innate immune system. You can see from here. And then there is a role for uh, adaptive immune system because when you get sick, you know, fever, this is inflammation. Now, this slide, for example, is it important because this is basically a, a legend for the next figure. And you can see from here that innate immune system also has a way to respond to any foreign invasion, right? So you can see from here, so they have a pattern recognition receptors, right? So these are their uh, when something like extracellular pathogens come, they have all one, two, three, four. So there is a good reason for innate immune response cells to go after some of the generic things. I don't know why it's making so much noise. Okay. So. Uh, in adaptive immune response, basically, as you saw in the previous chapter, it takes time to kick in. It needs to make antibody. It needs to make memory cell. But the problem is right now. So we have to deal with problem right now. So we have an innate immune system. So it will also, it's not going to leave bacteria and other things all alone. It's going to go after them. But again, there is a good reason. So these are some of the non-specific immediate tools for innate immune system to go after anything that comes their way. And you can see from here, so if I was to ask you, for example, do you think that innate immune system is going to take care of gram-negative bacteria, gram-positive bacteria, blah, blah? The answer would be yes. Because some of the receptors uh, presented by these foreign invaders roughly, non-specifically, can be identified by the cells. And these are pattern recognition receptor, non-specific, but they will go after that, and they're all called tall-like receptors. And the other example was if, for example, bacteria comes in, and then they are microbial polysaccharides, and you have menos binding lectin, it doesn't care which bacteria is coming in, it's going to go and bind to it and help uh, take care of it. So innate immune response has a role to play. That's the whole idea. Uh, so there are cells involved in the immune system. You need to know what is a primary lymphatic organ, what is a secondary lymphatic organ, and you can say primary is thymus. So that's probably a question over here. Uh, a little bit of detail of what the primary and secondary is. Uh, the other couple of slides are coming in to give you uh, the anatomy of uh, this lymphatic organ. Nothing much to be asked except uh, this one. So you can see from here, uh, they are germinal centers in lymphatics. And then they are uh, 
different places where T cells and B cells are located. And you can see, for example, if I was to ask you, in a cut section of lymph node, where would you think that you will find mostly uh, T cells? So you can see paracortex. These are where mostly T cells are present. And then again, antigen presenting cells basically are in medulla. So these are the two important things. And then again, you also see most of the B cells are in the lymphoid follicles in the center. So T cell is an outer mantle, and B cells are the, in the middle. That's what it is, right? Okay, uh, this again uh, was an important part because I wanted to ask you that uh, there's a circulation of lymph, and the, what are the possible routes for antigen to enter into us? And what would be the fate of that, right? For example, if antigen was to going to, uh, you get a cut or it goes through your blood, so it's going to go to circulation, it's going to go to spleen, and it will go to efferent lymphatic. If it's going to go through your skin, again, it's going to go to lymphatics, and again, since it also circulates with the blood, so there's like a, a conduit where lymphatic system talks to that. And then again, there are pious patches. The whole idea is that regardless of whatever route of antigen goes in via bloodstream, skin, or gastrointestinal, any muco, any, any way, they will be together. So they will end up in the lymph node, they will end up in the blood, and they will end up in the spleen. So there is a check and balance. So that's what the whole idea is. And this basically talks about that. The other concept over here is that uh, naive lymphocytes. So there's a question over there. Naive lymphocytes basically are those uh, cells which have not seen an antigen as yet. So they need to see an antigen to become activated as we go along. Again, uh, this slide gives you an idea that we teach you innate immunity separately we teach you acquired immunity, there are differences. So have innate immunity, there are physical barriers and chemical barriers. Acquired doesn't have that. Both of them have cells. In acquired is specific, it's antigen specific, as compared to uh, innate, which is non specific. It just goes for a general pattern for recognition. And these are the, some of the cells over here. And then again, uh, specific will produce cytokines and antibodies, but cytokines can come and have an effect on both, right? So the idea is that acquired and innate would cooperate uh, to face an immune response, okay? But some of them, for example, you can see from here, skin mucous membrane are a part of innate, innate immunity, pH, Lipids, enzyme, they're part of, because it's non-specific. But this is more of a specific, very specific uh, immune response in terms of, so expect differences between innate and acquired and some of the questions over there. Now, uh, antigens, again, uh, some of the questions are right there. Uh, I would want you to know what is an immune response, what are the requirements of immunogenicity? Remember that antigens may or may not provoke an immune response. That's a basic understanding. So when an antigen evokes an immune, immune response, we call it immunogen. Right? What is it that would qualify for a particular antigen to mount an immune response? Okay, so that's what we want to know. We need to classify antigen. We need to look at the properties of antigen. So be ready for at least five questions over here. And if I was to go over here, I'll just tell you exactly what do I have in my mind other than the definitions that you saw. And then, of course, I will ask you uh, the properties of uh, immunogen. They have to be low molecular weight, like antibiotics and drugs. Is it correct? No, it's not correct, because they don't have an immune response. So it has to have a high molecular weight. So that's a concept over there. You cannot pick a distractor which will say high 
low molecular weight. Low molecular weight, and it says in the back, and they should not normally have an immune response. Okay. So if if you want to make a low molecular weight provoke an immune response, you have to ha add a protein. You have to conjugate it. So I would say, how would you make? How would the we know for sure that drugs have a hypersensitivity reaction, but according to our principle, they are more low molecular weight. They should not, but they still do. You have tons of you know you'll have drug cards that remember tons of side effects, tons of hypersensitivity reaction. But you will say, well, we were told in immunology that there should not be a immune response. So then the question comes, what causes the immune response? The reason is that either you or your body tags that with the protein. So make it a high molecular weight, right? Or conjugate it. And there are a lot of conjugation taking place. For example, heptin. So once the heptin attached to it is, then there's a problem there. So we have to then work up on the drug to make sure that it doesn't conjugate with anything that causes a problem, okay? But uh, <clears throat> have said that, also remember uh, that I will say, okay, uh, I sometimes I ask simple questions. So I say, immune response have been d demonstrated against all of the following except, right? So this is for sure, if you have seen this slide and you know for sure that uh, there have been carbohydrate, lipid, protein, nucleoside that we have seen an immune response. Now, how and why, that's a subject of discussion, but now for sure they are there. We do see <coughs> response in drugs, antibiotic, food additive, cosmetics, right? And then again, Normally, we should not see response against small symptoms, but again, I told you, if you add a carrier to it, if you add a conjugate to it, it becomes high molecular weight. So that's a whole concept. That's why when they develop something and they give it to you, it shows a lot of side effect, then you have to either purify it or to conjugate it with something that should not evoke an immune response, okay? And mostly they are proteins, okay? Now, um, you should memorize. It's, it's simple. So uh, requirements of immunogenicity. But remember, sometimes the questions are not straight. You know, people say, "Why you ask a confusing question?" But questions are to, meant to be distract. You know, distractive. That's the whole. It's not like straightforward questions. It has to uh, to test you. It has to test the depth of the knowledge. So basically, you can see. You know for sure foreignness, high molecular weight, chemical complexity, degradability, and interaction with host MSC mostly, right? So these are some of the things uh, so that will mount an immune response, okay? And these are not the only things, but these are some of the things. So you should understand, uh, you know, this thing, for example, the whole idea is the basis of immune system is that your body recognizes something as non-self is going to go after that. It is designed for that. Okay, and then again, uh, also remember the if you more foreignness, more response. So response of immune system is directly proportion to a particular immunogen being foreign, okay? So the more complex, you know, since they're directly proportional, it's not inverse. So if something is very, very complex, you of course. And then my question will, and I did explain that in the class, why would, you know, a substance that is degradable will mount an immune response? So this is like, you know, no critical thinking. The one, the, if I ask you which one of them, this is simple recall memory. But if I ask you, what do you think, why do a substance that is degradable is likely to provoke an immune response? And then I will give you a choice. And I did discuss that in the class. And uh, it's not in the notes. You can find it in the book, but it is there. For example, I'll give you an example for that. And it says mostly as well. Because remember, 
as a principle, proteins have to be broken up within the cell and a small peptide has to go and stick on top of MSC and be presented to T cell. So what it implies is that unless and until you can break it apart, cut it into pieces and present it to a T cell, there will be no immune response. That is why a thing that is more degradable, right, will have an immune response. So this will be a critical thinking on your part. The next question will be, <coughs> and it's within the bracket mostly. Again, I said that why do you think that something that interacts with your host major histocompatibility complex should give you allergy? I know it's written over there. You say, yes, it is there. But how and why? Because it may not be in this chapter. It is in later chapter. It is something that we discuss. Again, concept, conceptual question. Reason being, unless and until your major histocompatibility gene take that protein up, the broken protein, and present it on top of that, there will be no immune response. Right? Because remember, as a rule, when it comes to protein, T cell will take care of it. T cells are blind. Right? They have to put on the glasses, like glasses. So they have to see something one side of the eye is a TCR, right? The other, they will see an MSC. They have to see both these things before they would do anything, okay? So these are some of the uh, uh, critical thinking question. And once you read it casually, right? And you say, why on earth Dr. Fazal put mostly? What was he talking about? Well, even if you have forgotten, you can go back and look at the podcast because that's maybe one thing advantages. But just by you memorizing that, not going to help you. Because I will definitely test some of you for recall, especially for most of the people who want to vomit out the knowledge. Good enough, I'm okay with you. But uh, you're just looking at it, a grade C level. But if you want to go for critical thinking, it's going to be a little bit higher level. If you want to go for A, it has to be a higher level. Because A's are not given uh, for people who can just, you know, uh, uh, cram and vomit. That's not the purpose, right? So try to understand and try to, uh, okay. So you can see from here, uh, but also remember, and it, I've said that, exceptions. And I'm going to talk about that at 11, autoimmunity. We teach you something because the basic immunology, had there been no exception, you would be all out of job. Because everything is okay, there's no disease, both of us actually, not you, out of job. So the more complicated the things are, the more complicated the signaling path pathways are, the more scope of us treating and looking for the patient. So we are unfortunately in the job market that's totally dependent upon, you know, not only people becoming sick. So it's just like a, you know, a big company makes flu vaccine and there is no flu season. Just imagine the losses that they will go through. So it is their interest. And I was talking to one of this person, he's working, or she's working in uh, Walgreens, and say that, oh, we get bonus if we kind of persuade the patient to get a flu shot or this shot or that shot. So they get a special bonus for that. So this means, what it means is that Walgreens and uh, whatever, they may have overstock. It is maybe it's not required, but they want to push it. So. Take it from the other side that, you know, it's good, but there are always exceptions, right? Now, systems can fail. Best of all, the system, human system will fail. So we'll discuss how and why so we can fix that. So you can see over here, foreignness and autoimmunity is one reason. We talked about high molecular weight and then uh, pretty much the same. And uh, you can also see that uh, penicillin, progesterone, aspirin, you would hardly see anybody reacting to it. We do react to penicillin, how and why. You need to understand basics of hypersensitivity since we have not discussed that, so I will not ask in detail, but you can see that uh, everything that is there in terms of drug has a molecular weight. 
So when they design the drug, they basically will look up at, the mic, uh, uh, at the molecular weight. And then again, the question, if I was to make a question, so I will say, uh, generally, a, any substance which is more than 6,000 Dalton will be immunogenic, right? So that will be a statement. So the answer is yes, right? Because generally they're immunogenic if they're more than six. So we know the cutoff point. So you're talking about a cutoff point. So we, if I was to design a drug, I would rather have it less than one kilodalton because then I'm safe. The upshot for this one basically is we want you to know what exactly is going on. Chemical complexity, we talked about that, higher the complex and protein especially in that. Uh, as a rule, simple things basically are seldom immunogenic, right? So uh, if somebody asks you, you know, um, I've got allergic to water, so the chances will be, unless this is, is bottled water, or something's going on because it's so simple a molecule, so simple a thing that you should not. Okay, so the simpler the things, the better it is. But you can see from here the challenge that we have uh, with the food that we take. And uh, some, I mean, they're both extremes. I wouldn't say that. And especially for people like myself who know a lot and then you are in trouble. Because some of the things, even you take a chocolate bar and you start reading ingredients, oh my goodness, 50 ingredients. So you just imagine, don't have to read anything. What does your knowledge say? The more complex a thing, the chances are it will invite a problem. Okay, simple, simple without even going, so the more synthetic a thing, no, no matter what manufacturers claim, is as simple as that. Okay? Okay, protein structure, you should know. Uh, degrad degradability, I already told you. Why is it that uh, we want to go for that? And uh, <clears throat> you can see from here, uh, one of the things is mentioned over here, the carbs are not processed. So no T and no T response because I've been saying it over and over time and I would take as a, uh, I wouldn't say insult, but a blunder if somebody still tells me and doesn't know that we need T cells to take care of processing protein antigens. I've been saying it over and over again. If somebody <coughs> asks you, I take food, carbohydrates, lipids, fats, and protein. Which one of them do you think can I become allergic to, which has the highest incidence of proteins? But again, having said that, protein don't come alone. They come with complex glycoprotein, and you know this. So they kind of attach to different varieties. But you can see uh, for, uh, but the, the, so this is again a recall memory, okay? And some of the question will come later when I will talk about that, uh, like in, in vaccine, for example. In a vaccine, for example, right now, 25 out of 27 vaccines that are out there in the market are based upon uh, protective, protective antibodies. So critical thinking question will, will be, if I give you a vaccine that only has a carbohydrate moiety, right? Do you think it will produce antibodies? Yeah, this is a question for you. Do you think any, any vaccine that does just carbohydrate moiety, will it produce antibody? This is a critical, this is not a recall question, it's a critical thinking question based upon the knowledge. Yes. Just me, yes or no. You can say. Yeah. Oh, you don't have to raise your hand. Okay. All right. It's going to be yes or no. Yes. Because B cell will see it for B cell. But again, the antibodies B cell produce without help of T cell are not high performing antibodies. So that is coming in another lecture. The question then is, why do the vaccines fail? Why do you have to, these are conceptual things. 
But anyway, so this is like a critical thinking. There's not all the question will be like that, but just keep that in mind. Okay, um, routes of administration. Uh, why, why, for example, the question I may ask it, why do you think uh, uh, if a vaccine is given via skin that, or which of, which of the following routes of antigen entry will pro provoke strongest immune response? Again, it's simple as that, skin. The next question will be why? The reason is because it has the best professional uh, antigen presenting cell like skin, Langer hands, because they process the antigen, right? And then again, uh, what happens if you give uh, an antigen or a drug oral, right? And you can see from here, it may lead to systemic tolerance, right? So you may not know systemic tolerance. We will talk about it today because our skin and mucous membranes, since they take a big towel for foreign antigen, so we normally if you were to design something, you would design anything, and it's just like you design a car, and any little signal is gonna show up like 20 different signals in your car every day you come up. But that's not the interest of the manufacturing plant. Right? They wanna make sure that whatever signal comes because of the problem has a good reason. There'll be minor things here and there, so you don't wanna kind of make a big fuss about that. So the, the whole idea is that you are eating lots of different antigens and immunogens and bacteria and whatnot in your food and you're always eating in the class as well. So you're not supposed to eat in the class. So the thing is, is that uh, there has to be a natural mechanism in your gut to tolerate it. Simple, tolerate, we call it tolerance. Right? We'll talk about that detail. But you can see from here, there's a good reason for us to pick up a, a, a particular route. Uh, I do want you to know what is a primary immune response, a secondary immune response, differences between these two, and it will come in another slide, uh, another picture, when it will tell you that if you have a primary immune response, innate immunity will come, and we'll take care of it. There will be antibodies produced. The very first antibody to be produced will be IgM, and IgG will also come, and then again, uh, when your system sees a foreign antigen, it takes time for processing. It's not an immediate. So what it does is that when it sees the first time, it deals with that antigen, but it makes sure that it makes memory cell. So if, if you expose the body to an antigen, second time is ready for response. So second time there is a humongous, huge response. And I also gave you an example for the booster doses. So you have one dose, it kind of tests your immune system, prepares, and you give after a month or so second dose, and you make tons of uh, antibodies. In the first primary response, the antibodies you produce are short-lived, right? But in the second immune response, then the antibodies should live for the rest of life. But again, there is another question coming up, um, especially for uh, uh, some of the uh, vaccines that we get. So they are thinking that, uh, you know, for example, the vaccine that they uh, prepared for like 10, 20 years ago need to be improved. They have to have a very profound immune response because whatever antibodies they produce should stay in the system for a good amount of time. They should not disappear. That's the whole idea. You have to have a very high quality antibodies. So that's what the basis for that, because people will come to you and say, you know, I had this, uh, do I need to have the booster dose for DPT or polio or this and that? Because I just heard in the news that uh, whooping cough is coming up, though I have been vaccinated against that, and that is true. So they will start thinking. So the reason will be maybe there is a deteriorating levels of protective antibodies in your body. So we need to do something. So things of that nature keep on coming, but you should have a scientific answer and then you can see over here, uh, body will make a memory B cell. The difference between primary and secondary immune response. I did spend time, and I think uh, the antigen binding site and uh, the antigen binding site for B and T cell. For sure, one question. So you better understand that. 
that these are two different cells, so they interact with different antigen. And you can see, this was the easy part, T cell has a TCR, B cell has a BCR. This is where the problem lies. And I gave you mnemonic for that, if you remember. Uh, protein, polysaccharide, lipids, all taken up by B, but T cell is pure meat. So it's going to go for proteins. And then again, uh, it doesn't want to take care of soluble. So the, unless and until you pre present an antigen, protein antigen, on a plate of MHC, T cell would not care. So this means, in other words, it doesn't care about soluble antigen, but soluble antigens are there. So then B cells will come to take care of it. That's why you have that mnemonic of B and T cell in a lymph node living life family. And then again, uh, critical thinking will be epitopes, which are recognized, which are the special sequences that these antibodies see and, uh, and identify. Like this, it could be a very complex protein. You don't have to identify everything on there. You just identify a part of it. Like your identification is not your whole body. Well, maybe it's your whole body, but we look at the face. So your face, right, which may be one tenth of your whole body structure, the face of a protein or an antigen is taken as an epitope. So we take that as a snapshot and identify that, right? But having said that, fingertips are also good, iris is also good, biometrics, so and so forth. So you can see uh, antibodies will identify different parts of that. And the good thing is that you can make more than one antibody. So that's, a, that's an important thing. Uh, some of the uh, antigens, for example, residues, which are hidden, because this is physical world, both B cell and T cell, they have to physically see, recognize, and do things. There's no hidden thing. If something is hidden, and why I'm talking about that, if, if viruses are very strong, and if they hide something, then you would not make an immune response. You rather would get sick. But they're also very clever. They have their ways. So in this case, if you have hidden your you know, gun or your toxin or your whatever bad intention is, antibodies don't see it. If you don't see, everything's OK. All right? OK, uh, we talked about that. Uh, difference between one epitope, a antigen can have one epitope or more than one epitope or uh, same kind of epitope, different epitopes, and that usually happens in protein. You see the complexity. Because, and then again, we'll also keep in mind, the more complex a protein it is, you may think it's in bad, but it's in a good sense as well. Because a immune response to a protein is very profound, and it's very specific because you may have for this, even if you have one type of antibody, you will take care of that. But for this, you have to have one, two, three, at least four different types of antibodies. So it's going to be very, very important. And then you can see examples of carbohydrate moieties. These are important because it will come. And I want you to know that, uh, you know, especially the uh, ABO groups and ticoic acid, ticoic acid of gram-negative bacteria because it does mount an immune response. Recall memory for lipids, nucleic acids, again, though they are hidden, as I just said. So as a rule, so they are poor immunogens, but again, basic principle, if you conjugate to a protein like you do with SLE, which I'm going to discuss at 11, autoimmunity, exceptions are there, so you may up pick up an antibody against your own cell. That's where the problems come, but normally it should not. Proteins, we have spent all the time in the world, and you can see from here that they have this ability to react with TCR, and then so and so forth. Okay. Cross-reactivity. And uh, you can see that sometimes what happens, especially in the protein antigen, uh, what you saw that uh, you want to uh, take an antigen, right, and show it to your body so that it starts making antibodies. But the challenge is that you have to make sure 
the toxin that you are giving over there is not in the format that will evoke an immune response. So what you do is that you kind of, you know, cut the corners. You know, just like, uh, just like, uh, what's the best word? Just like a snake and you can take the venom out, right? So it's a, or, 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 or the tooth out. So that biting ability of that thing is gone. So we call it like toxin converted into toxide. It still will provoke an immune response, but would not cause a damaging thing, right? But what sometimes may happen that you want to make an antibody for a specific sequence of an epitope, and there may be similarity between this one and a distant one, right? So you intend to block this one, and in the process, it may block another thing. So there may be kind of that a immunological cross-reactivity. We'll discuss that uh, as a part of uh, strep throat. You'll see why do people who have a strep throat and they're not treated properly, they will end up having an autoimmune disease later in a part of the body because uh, that particular bacteria brings a part of the epitope and your body makes an antibody. So the antibody basically does not recognize the epitope present of bacteria, but there is a similar kind of epitope on your heart valves. So what will happen is that good enough, this antibody will eliminate those steps from your body, but later part of the, of the life, they will go and go after your heart valves and they will damage the heart valves. So this is kind of cross reactivity when, of course, they say friendly fire, but friendly fire is going to cost you a lot of things. So anyway, so that's something that uh, you to read and this is there. Adjuvants, the primary purpose for adjuvant is basically to enhance immune response. I think that's pretty much it for you to know. Uh, all other information, I don't want you to memorize that. It's all of, if you remember when I talked about that, I said just pay attention to what common adjuvants do. So what they do, so if I was to write a question, I say most of the adju adjuvants will enhance uptake of antigen, right? They will uh, induce co-stimulatory molecules on APC. So I'll just pick up like three, four, right? So all you need to know is that sometime we have to add on to uh, some of our vaccines or drugs to enhance the immune response. And you know for sure enhancement of immune response will mean better recognition of antigen, better response of an antibody, more MSC over there. So that is like a functionally important thing that you may see there. Okay, we spend a lot of time on antibodies, and I think um, antibodies are going to be very favorite, very, very favorite. So we normally would pick up five questions, but if I was to pick like two questions from your chapter number six, which is difficult, rest three will be from antibodies, because this is one of the favorite. So you can see I do want you to spend a lot of time on properties of antibody. Uh, how do you isolate or characterize? Well, that's basically chapter five. We'll talk about that and then type structures and then super family and I've been giving you all those mnemonics in the world that you have had a chance to look at them. But uh, some of the basic characteristics, what are they, uh, what do they do, what, what parts do they have, why they are specific and uh, why they have a, what kind of biological, journal biological activity that they have and then uh, we, we need to isolate them, we need to characterize them, and we can run them electrophoresis mobility, and you can see this basically is a tracing where you see especially if, for example, your body is producing more antibodies than it is required, extra antibodies, they're proteins, they're gonna clog the system, they will go and block and cause problems uh, different, this is a cancer, myeloma is a cancer, multiple myeloma. So this will be a cancer in, in, in itself, okay? Basic structure of light and heavy chains, heavy chains, their names, FAB and FC uh, components, and a uh, little bit of this information, 
they have biological activity, this is an antigen binding site, this is a variable site, and this one is basically a constant segment, FC, it attaches with the cell, we talked about that. Uh, fragment for antigen binding is a fab, which, which actually binds, and then um, the major idea was, and that again will be the genetics part of it, how is that we make different antibodies to a different antigen. So we have enormous, enormous capability. Bad example, uh, but maybe sticks in your mind. Uh, 300 million population in, in, in the USA, right? So if you were to apply for any uh, cell company, the chances are they will give you a different number, right? What are the chances of you uh, applying for a new cell phone number and they give you the same number? Well, I would say slightly because they go, what they normally do is that if you give your number back to them, they keep it in a recycling mode. So that's where it stays for one month if there are the, some errors and then they will reissue, right? Now, let alone the whole world, five, six billion, right? So these are only nine numbers, right? One, two, three, four, six, seven. So you have this capability of that kind of specificity and, uh, you know, that kind in even the numbers of cell phone, let alone the antibodies. So they pick up your genes. So we have this ability to do that. And because the reason is that we have different amino acids and this is like pick up from there and we need it. So that is basically the most important thing that we need to understand. And then again, uh, you saw over here antigen come with different epitopes, the antibodies are made. So these are the light chains and heavy chains, very, very specific. That's the biggest achievement in medical history in terms of cure. You know what is the biggest achievement in terms of cure in medicine, medical history? <coughs> Vaccines. So if you ask somebody, have you taken care of diabetes? No. Hypertension? No. Cancer? You keep on saying no, 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 no. But if you ask about, about polio? Yes. Smallpox? Yes. And the reason is vaccines. So vaccines are the only uh, so-called success stories based upon immunology and based upon this thing. So the reason is specificity. Okay, so you can see this is something that I want you to understand and some other slides are there just to make that understanding. Isotype, let me jump to that uh, mnemonic that I made and then I'll spend some time on that. So pretty much the same expectation is that uh, journal, I don't want you to, I'm not gonna ask you to draw these pictures and I'm even gonna ask you uh, the details for that but just roughly, uh, and should stay in your system for a good amount of time, right? So I, it's not a, a learning and vomiting. The whole idea is uh, retention. That's again, one of my objectives is that, uh, well, if you're going to read like a day or two before, I can assure you it's gonna be just uh, cramming and vomiting. It cannot be possible. So uh, linking, discussing, uh, associating this with some other thing that you can make, that's what the memory is like. Association with an incidence, with, a, with something in your mind so you can retain it over a period of time. So that was, I just gave you an example for that, right? And you can make tons of them. And there are tons of them already there because of the cramming thing. So you can see that uh, you want to know if exactly the concentration in the serum, right? You want to know their names, you know, like uh, which one of them are present in the milk, which one of them can bind to FC receptor, and you can come up with any mnemonic, which one are there within the vessel and have the cap capability to go out of vessel. And this we will realize today that if they go out of vessel, how much damage do they cause? We'll talk about that today. And uh, they all agglutinate, right? But some of them are better agglutination. So you can see like uh, micro, 
has a better agglutination, which one of them has uh, more antibacterial, antiviral, antitoxin immunity. And uh, you can see from your gamma has more. So roughly shape of the body in terms of, you know, what the structure is, micro has a lot of valency and, you know, IgA is double, things, very simple things. Uh, whether they are, sometimes they have this chain, so you'll see the J chain to joining chain. So joining chain is only needed when they are, happen to be two or more. Whether they are present in secretions, right, they activate complement, and I've got some mnemonics for you over here. And then again, uh, placental uh, passage, very important, very important. But there's a question always there because uh, some of them are. And then uh, again, these antibodies attach to cells, right? And then again, you can make up your own that this is a bigger family, BNT cells, and uh, they have some ability to do some things because today's lecture you will feel once I, uh, this basically is a little bit different than the one I posted earlier. So again, just a mnemonic and uh, you can make your own mnemonic as long as uh, it sticks in, in your mind, you have a better way of reproducing is, I, I don't mind. And rest of the informant information is pretty much coming from there, okay? Structural things, we talked about that, details for that. This was a slide uh, that probably many of you may not have realized what is going on, or what is it that uh, you want to know? Number one, you can see it binds with an FC portion, not FF, right? And then it has its endocytosis, it goes into the cell, right? The reason is that because it has just picked up an antigen, right? And then this antigen need to be processed uh, within the cell. It has to be dissociated and lysosome will take care of it. And then uh, antibody has to be recircled. So it has a very precise and definitive way of recircling that. And sometimes uh, if your receptor is not present, then of course you are losing IgG. You cannot recircle that. We talked about the biological properties, the details are there, many different slides over and over again. And uh, we give antibodies as treatment. You can see from here, neutralization of, because PAIN, uh, precipitation, agglutination, and uh, immobilization, right, and neutralization. So you can see that uh, all these toxins, if they are there, so basically antibodies will come and they act by mostly blocking their active sites. So their active sites on this toxin, which are going to cause problems, they will just block it and just bring them down. So that's why I say best choice for passive immunization, transfer antibody. So when you heard in, you know, what called uh, real time story, somebody is bitten by a snake, you have to rush to the hospital, and then hospital has to make sure that they have this IgG and want to give it to them. And we did talk about all these things and we will keep on talking about that, how antibodies are there. And I just told you that uh, 25 out of 27 antibodies are based, uh, vaccinations are based upon our ability to, to have good protective antibodies. So antibodies is there. And right now, while we are sitting, we already have all those antibodies. The teachers can be determined, because they're very specific. If you've been vaccinated for, 20 different uh, vaccines, they will pick up 20 different antibodies very precisely from your body to so test you. So this is that specific. Uh, passage of Ig through placenta, part of passive immunity. This is basically uh, IgG. And then you can see uh, pretty much the same uh, reason. And uh, some of the uh, concept forming things again will be the so babies don't have well-developed uh, immune system. They cannot synthesize antibodies, right? So basically, uh, if they do, then basically, you know, what's happening is that uh, IgM and Ig a little bit. But the whole idea is that uh, protective antibodies are passed on. Because sometimes the question they may ask is that uh, 
can the protective immunity be transferred from mother uh, to the baby? The answer will be yes. And uh, for, for critical thinking, in the previous slide, remember I said you have to have that specific receptor on top of those cells for antibodies to attach. And you can see uh, that particular receptor is down-regulated. So that is down-regulated. So if the body doesn't want these antibodies to come and attach, so they up and down-regulate receptor. So we learn from fetus that we can also do the same if you want to up-regulate a particular receptor or down-regulate, and that's what we do. Right? Some of the cytokines especially would up-regulate, and some of them will down-regulate. Okay? So that's basically uh, another important thing. You can see uh, clostrum. Clostrum IgG is the first milk that comes from the uh, mothers. That's called clostrum. So that has a IgG. So that's why it's protective. Uh, FC receptor attaching to it, properties you can uh, read on your own. But again, uh, we can see from here, if I was to ask you which antibody is in highest concentration in all these different secretions, right? So it's an IgA. And uh, for IgA, remember I told you earlier in the figure, some of these uh, antibodies exist intravascular and sometimes in extravascular. Probably at that time it didn't make sense to you. But now if you look at this picture, it should make sense to you because this antibody is, is going to go extra vascular because, you know, this is uh, epithelial. So this is a lumen of, this is a lumen of uh, that particular gastrointestinal tract or respiratory tract. Okay, so these antibodies are there placed on that. So these are a part of our mucosa. So this is in our, what do you call, uh, saliva or all mucosal secretions and there's a good way and you can see that there are very precise receptors that will chaperone if you remember me using that term so that is good for IgA properties of different molecules and uh, this is again remember I said the primary response so this has come again difference between a primary response a secondary response and a good figure over here primary immunogenic stimulus it could be infection. That's why they say uh, if you have had a primary infection, many times you must have heard from you know your grandies that you know, my such and such sibling son had chicken pox. So what she was implying it that she has had her share of chicken pox, so she would not have it again. This is true because of this protective nature of antibodies, right? So that was a a good observation. And you can see uh, primary stimulus, IgM come first, IgG. But you will notice that if you just give one booster shot, if I, you, if I was, a patient comes and I just give critical thinking question, I give that patient one booster do shot, do you think that uh, protection is good enough? You'll say no. Then the question is why? What is the limited immune response? I want to hear exactly, specifically, based upon this graph. Because the antibodies are going to disappear. The idea for vaccination is it, they are protected for the lifetime. So if you give a vaccination only one shot, what's the point? I mean, you just wasted your money. Because it's going to just protect you for like maybe two weeks, three weeks. But this, is this what you want? No. So you can see both antibodies coming to declining phase zero. So that is a scientific answer. And that is a critical thinking. So there's always a, in any slide, there's always a recall memory. And there's a critical thinking. Right? So you have to kind of associate. And you can see if you get a secondary immunogenic stimulus, again, IgE. And then... The second question, really, which of the following antibodies 
will give you protective antibodies for lifetime. And then you have a choice of IgA, IgB, IgC. Uh, IgA, IgB, IgD, and E. The answer is IgG. So IgG are going to stay for rest of your life. So we, this is our, so this is the difference between primary response and secondary response. I did spend time on IgG superfamily. This was initial lecture, but you can see they pretty much look alike. So they, they're all different types of those molecules that are attached over here. And we just did discuss that, you know, they look like alike. We have this chain, intraplasmic chain, and then MSC molecule. So they have many things in common. That's why we kind of jumped. If, if I was to ask a question, which of the following is not a part of super IG family? Or which of the following is a part of super IG family? So I would put a immunoglobulin, T cell receptor, B cell receptor, MSC, or poly IG receptor. You know, does anybody remember where poly IG receptor was present? I just said a second ago. Where was the poly IG receptor present? It was present outside the epithelium of intestine. When I said that IgA needs to be transported from inside to outside, you need a IG, poly IG receptor. If you look at a couple of slides back, that exactly was there. Okay. Again, comparison between these three, and uh, you can see from here immunoglobulin, nature of antigens they bind, and then uh, because sometimes you, if I ask you which of the following bind an antigen, and you just get confused, then you start thinking, wait a minute, I know that M immunoglobulin binds an antigen, but T cell does it bind an antigen? MSC does it bind an antigen? The answer is yes. Okay, so this is something that uh, we want to do and find out. Uh, chapter 5 is something that I found out a little bit difficult and I will write, but again I want to give you and I will test you only for the basis. And those of you who came to the lab, I did mention about that, right? The whole idea is, the whole idea for chapter 5 is that we want to find out whether you are infected with a disease, how are you recovering, how is your uh, chemotherapy or therapeutics doing, right? And what is your immune status? So we can use this knowledge of immunology to uh, come up with diagnostic test. So if you've been infected, you either will have an antibody antigen in your system or will have an antibody in the system. For example, this morning you got infected with, well, hepatitis A, I'll make a little bit. So the chances are, if I was to test you there and then, would I find an antigen in your system or an antibody in your system? Yes. Hmm? Louder. <laughs> Can I repeat the question? If you are infected with H, Hepatitis A this morning, and I want to test whether you are infected. So am I looking for an antigen in the body or antibody in the body? Antigen, because antibodies take time to appear. So sometimes the tests are like we are looking for antigen or antibody. So these are the tests, chapter 5. So we are looking for antigen-antibody reaction. It could be immunoassays, cellular assays, cell culture, experimental animal models, and so on and so forth. So the whole idea is, since so an antigen and antibody are very specific reaction, right? So if you have an antigen of hepatitis A, I have prepared a diagnostic kit which has a specific antibody for hepatitis A. And they are very specific. So this means the antibody I have would only bind to hepatitis A you have. Okay? So that is the basis of the test. And uh, you can see over here, basis of immune assays, uh, specificity, and then we can also serotype microbial antigens. So what happened is that, for example, commonest cause for uh, pneumonia is streptococcal pneumonia. 
And when we will talk about that, you will think maybe it's just one bacteria. Well, it's one bacteria, but it has like 23 cousins. That's what we say. 23 different types of them. So once they get into your system, we don't know. And they cause pneumonia. They may cause, you know, uh, meningitis. It's mandatory uh, for the high school kids to have that. So the reason is that we can do serotyping. What we will do is that we'll take your serum from the blood and test you with all those 23 different types because your body will make a very specific antibody. So these are very, very specific. And then again, uh, the, so the, the, the basic antibody lecture that you saw over there, an antigen was separate. But if you were to look at tests, for example, so you can see from here, uh, there is an antigen and there is an antibody. So this is a uh, univalent and undeterminate antigen happen, and your antibody see it, an antibody will bind to it, right? But when the antibodies bind to, to that, they, in this case, they are not cross-linked. Because remember, if they are not cross-linked, you will not see precipitation. Those of you who came to the lab the other day, you, you saw that there was not good, I, I think I just noticed one or two, they had a good clumping. Otherwise, there was no cross-linking to a naked eye. So we have an antigen or antibody, and then we mix them together in the test, and then we see whether they basically have agglutinated, precipitated, or kind of clumped together, and then we test them. So this is the basis of all the tests which are out there. So all this test, pregnancy test, step throat test, any other immediate test, we call it uh, like, uh, you know, like uh, a swab test, immediate test, over-the-counter tests available, they are all immunological based. But the principle is either you pick up an antigen, so if they ask you to put a drop of urine, so either they are picking up an antigen or an antibody. If they say put a drop of blood, so again the same thing. If they say swab your uh, mouth, so your cells, they're picking up something. So either antigen and antibody, so they are very specific. Some of the tests, and they would label it on that sheet of paper, they're already labeled, and you put the drop, so it's going to give a color. So the whole idea is that they basically bind to each other. You don't have to go in detail, you can read it on your own, but the idea is that uh, some of the tests, you will hear that uh, ELISA, for example. ELISA is a very common test done. Enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. And all you need to understand by the basic principle of the lab that half of you will do on Monday, that you have red blood cell, right? And this red blood cell will have an antigen on top of that. Either it's going to be A, B, both, or none. That make sense? Or there is another antigen we call rhesus antigen, which is called D. So if you, you're going to be A positive, B positive, AB positive, AB negative, or O. Right? Universal. So you can see from here, we'll give you a bunch of antibodies, and they will tag onto your cells. If there is no agglutination, what it will mean is that, for example, we'll give you three. Anti- a, anti-B, anti-AB. So this means you are negative for all these three. Because the rule is that if you have a antigen A on your red blood cell, you should not have an antibody for A. If you do, then your antibody will lyse your cells. Normally. Does that make sense? So this is the basis of tests that you normally see, and then they kind of agglutinate, and you visually see that, that agglutination, and that's the base, basis of the test. So that's one form of the test. Then there are more sophisticated tests, and you can see we have 
pollution, precipitation, blah, blah, blah. And you can see they're all based upon a concept. That's what I wanted to give you in this lecture. Well, let me run through that. And actually, I don't need to do that because uh, we already talked about that in the class. And again, uh, I'll see if I can give you some questions regarding that. All right. Because uh, I, we just got like 25, 30 minutes of this. I want to make sure that we jump onto the ones that we, okay. This again uh, was posted, was not delivered in the class, posted on YouTube and you can read it on your own. Uh, the whole idea is that where is this diversity for TCR and BS, BCR, basic simple genetics. And you can write it down if you are not clear that what is it I'm gonna talk about. Uh, how come we generate different antibodies? How come we generate different type of T cells? Now the whole idea is so there is a prototypical gene coding for transneural protein. So you can see over here, we have a genomic DNA. So all your cells have a genomic DNA, and they are different exons, exon one, two, three, and these are little introns over here. And as we mature, we kind of do sorting. So you can see from here, we'll pick these exons, and as we are Maturing in terms of mature messenger RNA, we basically are cutting these introns and kind of joining them together to form a messenger RNA because then the proteins will be formed and the proteins basically in this case, the immunoglobulin protein or Ig superfamily is attached over here, which has COOH. So all these protein determinants are coming from your genes. Some of them are representative over here, exon 1, some of them from exon 2. So these are the proteins that we have. So this a, so when I say that particular receptor expresses your gene, so that's what it means, right? So these are some of the things. So there is a organization and a rearrangement of this gene. That kind of matters. As I give an example, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and you want to give a cell number, so you kind of pick and match. and so that end up a different type of but like all genetic events they have to be regulated they have to be regulated so these these are many things that are happening now if you pay attention I think this will be easier for you gene rearrangement so there is a germline uh, remember three important part V D and J so in a V section, we have a choice of picking up 40. There are 40 different things for us to pick, one or two. And then J, and the D is not shown over here because we are talking about the kappa gene, light chain, because it's a part of heavy chain. So what will happen is when we go through rearrangement, we will pick up some over here, some over here, and put them together. So that's typically happening in gene rearrangements. We kind of pick up like alphabets. I gave an example of 23 alphabets. You want to write something up and you want to pick words. And this is basically editing. That's what the editing means. And then you will end up a, a C A M, M, amino terminal and carboxyl terminal. So everything basically the steps are because you have a lot of choices here. That's the whole idea. You have 40 choices here, here one to five choices and you mix and match. That's what is happening. Okay, this one is another important, then you can see, uh, now we have V, B, and J. And we have C region, which is a constant region, and you see there's a gene for gamma, alpha, micro, delta. So everything is gene. So we'll pick one of these, because we want to make IgG, IgM, whatever. Then we have a choice again, in V section, 50 choices, D section, 20 choices. J joining one to six, so we kind of do this splicing, mix and match, till we come up with a very specific number for a very specific chain of, so that's why we have diversity, because of the choices that we have. So our body will pick up, and once it makes that particular sequence of gene rearrangement, that will be very, very specific for that particular microbe. That, that was the whole idea for the genes. Okay, now another concept in this was that remember when you saw class switching, so your 
antibodies were made for making M and D, but you don't want M and D, you wanted G, you wanted E. So what is it that happens at the gene level that will command your genes that we not want to switch over? So in this case, you can see this is a switching zone, class switch, and this is under T cell influence. This is the most important thing. So if this was to pick up a, a micro, it will switch the sequence of genes, kind of switch, and then have whatever is required for a particular heavy gene. So there, I mean, that's about it. V, D, J, different segments, and you mix and match, put them together, you come up with a different gene. Uh, again, you can see uh, V, D, J recombination, and these are things which are happening within. Remember, we talked about the receptor, we talked about the intracellular pathway, but this is something which is happening in the nucleus. So that's where, you know, all these gene and command is coming up. So the whole idea, if I was to summarize that, and I think that's pretty much what, what I want you to know or cram or memorize is that every individual synthesizes an enormous number of Ig molecules, each act as a B cell receptor, right? And this diversity basically is coming from V, which is variable, D, which is diversity, and J for joining. And these are like heavy chains. H stands for heavy chain, and then we have light chains, right? And DNA from every cell in the body contains multiple VDJ gene. So every cell of our body has that option to, to go and recombine that. It's just like every cell of our body has the gene for producing insulin. But the question is, does everybody of our cell produce insulin? No. So only insulin will be produced by the pancreatic cells. But the gene is there. So this means the gene is not expressed. And if gene is not expressed, there's no protein synthesis. Okay? So all nuclear cell will carry this, all of our nuclear cell will carry the same information for the whole body. It's just the gene rearrangement that will make the difference. So this is what we call differentiation and they go through uh, rearrangement. I think this pretty much, what I would advise you for this one is to read the, uh, the summary at the end of it and some of the points that I have mentioned and then again, I would not even go in detail and test you for, uh, for the details. So there are multiple segments in the germline. We have the there's a random assortment and the whole idea is that because of choices that we have, we can pick up, mix, and match, and then we will come up with many important things. The only thing that clinically I wanted you to know that I will use today's lecture, from this lecture, today's lecture is that there is an enzyme. There is an enzyme which is called cytidine deaminase. So this is an enzyme which basic, basically plays a key role in the class switching recombination that you saw in somatic hypermutation and gene conversion. And this is good for us to know because once we found out an enzyme, we can play around with it, right? Because at that time when I presented this information, probably you said, what is it that I need to do for AID? When I teach you autoimmunity uh, today at 11, you will see what the use for that. And then quickly, uh, biology of BNT cell, pretty much the same. I would want you to, uh, Again, uh, no the definition of B cell, and they go to a precursor cells. I'm not going to ask you all the details, but you should know at least that uh, the difference between any immature cell and the mature cell is a mature B cell expresses a complete IgM and IgD. That's what the difference is. And then again, when it forms a memory cell, then again, it will shed off this M and D. And uh, for class switching, again, the important point was that uh, you have to have a T cell help. And again, the chains are coming pretty much the same story. You have VDJ segment, you do a diff different assortment, you process, and you come up with a gene sequence for different, different uh, parts of that BCR. So BCR, because it's a part of Ig, looks similar to immunoglobulin. 
but that's a diversity is coming from those three important gene segments because of the choices available that we have. Okay, we talked about programmed cell death and repetitive, you already know that. Okay, uh, we talked about the B-cell receptor, uh, these are antigen binding site, and then there is a uh, special attachment over here. We talked about responses for immature B-cell, and uh, you can see from here, antigens self-bound, immature B-cell sees that, it becomes mature, and then have an immune response. This basically will tell you that a, uh, an immature B cell may respond to self antigen, but a mature cell would not respond to cell antigen. Probably if I discuss today, that will kind of give you a better insight into it. And that's pretty much a typical story, how a, antigen, a B cell sees an antigen, and then it is going to either start making an antibody or ask for a T-cell help. And that is happening in the, uh, if you remember, I said that earlier that uh, this is a lymph node, T-cells are in the cortex and the uh, B-cells are in the follicle. And this is how they kind of help each other. And uh, that again is pretty much the same story. Uh, this slide, when I talked of this slide, I just told you two important concepts. One of the concepts I told you is that uh, if there are bacteria in the gut, and these are pious patches, M cell, and they pick up this antigen, they give a, a command to B cell to start making an antibody. So antibodies are made, obviously not over here, but in distant site like lymph node. But there is a signal that will say that we basically want to get rid of that particular uh, bacteria and you want to send back the immunoglobulins that we produce. So they need to go back over here. You can see from here to the mucosa. And this process of uh, recognition, production, commitment, and getting those antibodies back to where they are needed to get rid of these microbes, the process was called homing. So they home back, home back, that's what I said. And then uh, when I talked about uh, T-cell membrane and T-cell membrane, remember initial signal and, and uh, co-stimulatory molecule, this was the, the major signal we have, the B-cell receptor, and then we talked about the molecules that interact with the cell surface. So what you need to do for at least this part, uh, my expectation is that you should know and if you have seen the sample question as well, so what I would do is that I look for association. So I'm going to say, uh, like for example, MSC binds to a peptide, right? CD40 binds to CD40 ligand, right? And B7 binds to CD28. So these are like combination binding, and these are four or five important uh, keys that we have to unlock B cell activation, right? So I'm not going to go more than that. And uh, that's pretty much for this one. And then uh, this was a slide that I did not discuss uh, last time because I said it's a positive. And some of you came back to me and asked me this question, positive signal versus a negative signal. And I said that uh, positive signal is that uh, this bacteria is identified and this is a primary signal. If you want to enhance signal, so what happens is that they are complement, they will bind to those complement binding places on the bacteria. And then we have some receptor, co-receptor, they will also bind and they just kind of enhance the signal, a positive thing, because you need to speed up the process. So that, the question for this will be that, uh, I'll say, okay, what is the significance of a B cell having a co-receptor? The significance of B cell having a co-receptor is basically to enhance the signal. So what is, the molecule that is required to enhance the second signal and then you need a complement over there. Okay, so let me finish up in 10 minutes. So we, I think we spend ample time on that. And uh, MSC, what is the MSC definition of MSC, class one, class two. And uh, I said to you that uh, what I want you to know at least that there are uh, six classes for uh, six different forms of class one and one, two, three, four for class two. 
and they I also told you that uh, we we call it MHC but that originated from mice uh, ideally we should have called it uh, human leukocyte antigen because this is a human leukocyte chromosome 6 and that's where it is uh, so we you see that it's synonym HLA and MSC is the same thing as far as we are concerned then we talked about MSC restriction you need to know what MSC restriction is and we spent a lot of time on educating you that what are restrictions and a uh, very common question that uh, MSC2 bind with CD4 cell and MSC1 binds with CD8 and they basically have different function. This is the restriction that we have and that's what we were talking about. And uh, some of the slides, especially uh, later part in the structure uh, element, uh, let me show it to you. This one I said the difference between class 1 and class 2. Uh, I wanted you to know at least one part of it which is beta 2 microglobulin. So this is a beta 2 microglobulin and that is an important aspect. Then I also, when I mentioned this up slide, I also said that the size of amino acid is different. So that's again a question. MSC can only, has a smaller mouth. So MSC1 has a smaller mouth as compared to MSC2, which has a bigger mouth. So you have only uh, eight to nine amino acid sequence. That was important. And I told you beta 2 microglobulin. I also told you because people may have deficiencies in that. And then this was a process, we explained that in detail. So you pretty much know we're talking about exogenous antigen. When we come to expression of, uh, you know, this molecule, especially class 2, as compared to endogenous class 1. These are favorite pet question. And then again, if you see over here, there is a message that comes over here and the Golgi apparatus involved. And then we have this special presentation and processing. We already spent time on that. Differences between, uh, I think this was maybe a better uh, graph to see the structure differences, beta 2 microglobulin, that's the major difference. I would want you to know where class 1 and class 2 are expressed. Very easy, all nucleated cells have uh, class 1, right? And then also talked of upper regulation and then peptiding. peptide binding group of say one smaller mouth, two bigger mouth, and then they are specific antigen so it takes care for endogenous endogenous and exogenous so they are like six seven percent there so you need to kind of have a very strong link between these two and then again this will only talk to cd4 this will only talk to cd8 classically but this also said that nk cell so this will be an extra thing that don't get surprised to you say oh i you just told me cd8 but i did tell you NK as well in the later slide. So if you have choice one and two, you have to pick both. Okay, and then uh, this was the other one for the class one. And you can say virus, this is basically endogenous antigen. And everything basically is taking place within the ribosome. And then uh, mostly a viral protein. And it's a typical class one pathway. And all other slides basically uh, are the same. The only thing uh, I talked about the lecture was cross presentation, so you should ask yourself what is a cross presentation. Uh, what I said was then when a cell get infected with the virus, and then dendritic cell has an ability to basically uh, take up class one or class two because traditionally it should take class two, but since it's nucleated, so it can express class one and present to CD20, uh, CD8 as well. Now, expect one question from this slide, this critical thinking slide. So I will ask you that, uh, what, how would you make a cell unable to respond to an antigen? Because sometimes we do. What are the inherent things that will uh, enable or unable a cell to process an antigen? Of course, if there are not enough MSC class one, an antigen will not be present, right? So you have to have at least one peptide, at least one to, to show it to. But if it doesn't occur, then again, no response. Okay. And then uh, I also talked about uh, some other things that will bypass that. Short, I use the word short circuit. There's something that uh, will 
totally give you an uncontrolled response. I gave you example of a bacterial exotoxin. And then again, you know, there is another thing that uh, it kind of short circuits binds outside the peptide group and or it just able to activate 10% of the cell because you have to activate quite a good number of cells. Don't think that in the previous slide I said one peptide is enough for antigen processing, but make sure that we need to activate tons of lymphocytes. In this case, even you have to activate 10%, not a good immune response, right? And then again, uh, toxic shock syndrome and some other, and these are the other slide was an example for that, whatever we discussed. Okay, uh, inheritance, we talked about that, you inherit, that's pretty much it. I'm not going to ask you the details for that. Again, diversity because of those uh, VDJ genes. So let's jump to the T cell, pretty much the same. Uh, I want you to know uh, what is TCR complex, what is the use of co-receptor molecules, and again, what are the kind of, you know, interlocking things. And... Uh, Let's go on to the TCR, so you can see TCR, it doesn't have uh, beta-2 microglobulin, and it has CD3, and it has these signal transduction molecules, ICAMPs, so that was something that I said, and then the antigen binds over here, it has this carbohydrate moieties on the sides, right, uh, peptide presented to it, uh, like those hands of antibodies that bind FAB, it has this a hyper variable region that's what it is and uh, that's why our T cells are unique in terms of seeing an antigen so they basically have this ability to register a, a particular antigen and give it a computer tag that just belongs to that particular uh, epitope. I would want you to know what are the uses of co-receptor and what are co-receptors and uh, this is the list of the co-receptors. They are there. And a classical example for MSC class 2 and class 1, pretty much the same. CD4 is a co-receptor, and these are the same receptors. Okay? And uh, don't confuse with co-receptor and co-stimulatory molecules. Okay? Because when I say co-stimulatory molecules, basically what I'm talking about is, let me show it to you. This one. So... If I say co-receptor, I'm talking about this molecule. If I say co-stimulatory molecules, I'm talking about all these molecules. And they basically have a very, very precise function to do. For example, as I said in the B cell, uh, CD8 talks with B7 normally. So this talk of CD8 and B7 activates the cell but if you want to put a block to it so you will have a competitive inhibition by putting ctla4 cd40 ligand talks with cd80 uh, cd40 right and then there are some adhesion molecules that are there that you don't even know need to know the names but as we move along you'll figure out that what are they doing and why are they important okay Diversity, when it comes to diversity, pretty much the same story over and over again. V, D, J, coming from different, uh, different segments, and we generate response. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I would leave positive selection and negative selection on, on you. The whole idea is that those of you who are going to come at 11, you will get an idea that all your cells in the thymus, when they are educated, if thymus finds out that they're going to react to yourself, right, they are taken away from the system because we don't want that to happen, okay? So this is something that you want to study on your own. And then finally, quickly, last one, activation function of B cell. We pretty much discussed that. The only thing is that you can see the whole process, the whole process where, you know, infection, then cell and becomes active, takes it to the B cell process proceeds and then decides whether it's going to go for CD4 or CD8. So they are a paired interaction. So when you talk of paired in interaction, you can see again, as I've been saying over and over again, B7 talks to CD28 to activate. CTLA4 puts a break on that. CD40 talks to CD40L, right? And this is important for class switching. And then there are adhesion molecules 
and they are important in terms of uh, the sequence. For intracellular events, as I said, that I don't expect you to go in detail. Those of you who want to do research with me or anybody else, and there are, because quite a few people came to me and they're interested in research, so we are doing research on this side. We are coming up with some drugs, as you can see, acting on the signal transduction pathways. So I just kind of overly told you, I don't expect you to know, but, well, I do expect you to know, but I'm not going to ask you. Let me rephrase that. Because tomorrow, if they ask you where are those drugs acting, all the way from the initial signal to the final sing signal, these are the drugs acting over here. And these are some of the routes that are available for the drugs. And again, you can read it on your own. There are a couple of slides. Tons of drugs. Don't expect you to know. The only thing I just wanted to emphasize was that uh, T cells basically, when they get activated, they produce IL-2, which is a growth factor. And it will put a receptor over here so that this take an effect. And then uh, finally, I also said that there are some other ways to activate CD4 T cell. Because the, the whole idea in the first few slides is that you have to keep in mind uh, all the events from antigen recognition to antigen processing to intracellular pathway to effector immune response. When I say effector immune response, I'm talking about B cell activation, the making of antibody. I'm talking about T cell activation. T cell activation will lead to different type of T cells and production of these cytokines. Cytokine lecture per se, 11 is in next exam, but this picture over here is in this exam. Don't get confused. Okay, so I do want you to know uh, what are the cytokines produced by Th1 cell, Th2 cell, Th17 cell, because there are only two, three for you to remember, and what are the major functions. So I would definitely spend time on this slide. I'm going to pick one question from here and one question from here. So these are some of the things that you want to pay attention to. And uh, I would finish with this, uh, this one, and I think that maybe like an upshot that... Uh, B cell, if it wants to make a profound response, it needs T cell help. There has to be a T cell, B cell cooperation for a good, robust, positive, protective antibody production as well. So I hope, um, I hope that uh, 